right, welcome. This is Stephen Wagesback with LABI, and I am pleased to be joined, not just with a uh, distinguished member of the Louisiana delegation, but also a good friend, uh, Bill Cassidy. Um, for those that you have been living in the cave for a million years, you know that Bill Cassidy is our senator, our, uh, senior senator from Louisiana, first elected in 2014, but cut his teeth in politics much before that uh, in the state legislature, uh, in, the, in the state senate, and then in the Congress, and has, has had a long, distinguished career both in medicine and in, in uh, elected representative. So, Senator Cassidy, thanks for joining us here today. Hey, Stephen, very glad to be with you, and hello, everybody listening to the podcast. Absolutely. Well, well look, I, I know uh, time is short, so let's get right to it. Um, this week... Uh, President Biden's coming down to talk about infrastructure. Um, obviously, you have been you know, soaking into the bill. Kind of, get, What's your major takeaways of what you think the opportunities are for Louisiana? What's your thoughts on the proposal and where you think it should go from here? Right now, the bill has about 6% for roads, bridges. It's a $2.2 trillion bill. 6%. But 6% is for what we traditionally think of infrastructure, right. roads, bridges, airways. There's also a big component, so-called green energy. Now, in that green energy, there's actually some opportunities for Louisiana. We can talk about that. And over half of the bill is for so-called human infrastructure. Uh, now, it may be good stuff, but it's not roads and bridges. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so what Republicans have offered is let's double the amount of money that we're spending on roads and bridges, but let's decrease the overall price tag. Now, by the way, when I say decrease, we go from $2.2 trillion down to $600 billion. Oh, it's, it's a deal. It's a deal. <laughs> and we double the amount of money going for roads and bridges. The president's not going to accept that because it doesn't have the energy component. But we can add that energy component, think pipelines to take CO2 to sequester the CO2 beneath the ground. I still think that represents opportunity for Louisiana. So let's talk on that green energy piece in a second, but before we leave the infrastructure package. So, you know, out here in the real world, I mean, you hear from your constituents all the time. You know, that seems very sensible to, to, to cut the bill down in size, focus on roads and bridges. We know we need that. Why inside the Beltway is that hard for a very common sense plan like that to catch traction? So um, they know that if they want to get, uh, if they want to get um, something for – so-called human infrastructure, Mm -hmm. the best way to pass it is to link it with hard infrastructure. So it's a strategy, if you will. Right. The fact that they're talking to Republicans means they don't have the votes for it. So our opportunity lies in the fact that they may split off the so-called hard infrastructure and energy infrastructure and try and pass the so-called human infrastructure in a different bill. Now, by the way, some of this is good stuff. But it should be debated. I just don't think it should be lumped in with the, uh, uh, with the hard infrastructure. And some of it is new entitlements. And if you haven't noticed, we've got a debt and deficit problem. Yeah, it seems to be on the news these days. Well, occasionally. <laughs> uh, but it's related to entitlement spending more than anything else. And I'm a little leery about establishing a new entitlement. Well, I'm glad you're up there trying to focus that bill on what matters. Everyone knows we need infrastructure, but you don't need the mission creep that we're seeing to be seeing. I'm glad y'all are on it um, like a hawk. So let's talk about that green energy piece you mentioned, whether it be in in another bill down the road. Um, We're seeing that here in the legislature right now. There are bills moving in the legislature to try to, you know, allow for hydrogen to be used in certain, um, you know, uh, storage facilities and all here to kind of create that new economy down the road. There's been a lot of discussion over the last six months. Uh, for an energy state like Louisiana, obviously we're proud of that energy heritage. It's a big piece of what we are. But we all know over the next you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the American economy, the international economy is going to change in how we use energy. What are some of the opportunities for Louisiana in that evolution? Because what I hear here in the states are not that everyone doesn't understand there's an evolution coming, but that they're worried about how fast they're going to be forced to go there and the jobs that could be lost in the process. Walk through how you view this issue. There is so much opportunity for Louisiana and how this economy evolves. First, if you want to lower the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, most people who look at it in a sensible way say that you're going to have to both decrease emissions but also remove carbon dioxide from that. If you're decreasing emissions and removing, you've got to store it. There's a fellow from Columbia University in New York who testified before the Energy Committee in the Senate. I asked him this question. He said, Louisiana is the Saudi Arabia of the world for a geology in which you can store CO2. It's pretty good, huh? Yeah, that sounds good to me. 
So, so just play that out. And let me ask a question. Is that the salt domes? Is that basically what they're talking salt about? Salt domes, but also um, uh, our aquifers uh, okay. way, way down deep. Um, so, so more than one way. Um, so let's play that out in a couple different directions. First, you have to have the pipelines. There's going to be an opportunity to build those pipelines for the folks who now build pipelines. Mm-hmm. Um, I introduced the SCALE Act and the Biden administration, which, which helps pay for these carbon dioxide carrying pipelines. Um, and the Biden administration has included it in their infrastructure bill. Mm-hmm. So something that I can tell you fits the needs of Louisiana is supported not just by me and by my co-sponsor, Chris Coons, but by the administration. Mm-hmm. I'm cautiously optimistic that if we get an infrastructure bill, that will be in there. Secondly, regulating pipelines is always a big issue. Mm-hmm. Um, EPA, Region 6, as I'm told in the last stages of delegating to our Department of Environmental Quality the right to sign off on these pipelines. We're ahead of other states. So we think about competing with Texas, for example. I'm pretty sure we're going to be before them in terms of having a regulatory environment to approve these pipelines that could take CO2 out of the industrial affluent of Dow and store it beneath the ground or use the CO2 for another product line. Um, Now, Dow has made a commitment to net carbon neutrality by 2050. If we can set up an infrastructure where they're more likely to achieve net carbon neutrality in Louisiana than someplace else, that's one more reason for them to build out future operations in Louisiana. Other major employers have Procter & Gamble with their big facility up in Alexandria. Similarly, a pledge for net carbon neutrality. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. One more thing I'll say regarding hydrogen. Uh, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Janet Grantholm, um, she spoke about hydrogen. We spoke and then she echoed our conversation when she was in her confirmation hearings. You can make hydrogen from either uh, biomass, which is pretty expensive, or, which is called green hydrogen, or you can make so-called blue hydrogen, which is when you make it from methane, you take off the hydrogen atom, you make your hydrogen molecule, and you store or use the carbon. And blue hydrogen is probably one-fourth the cost of green hydrogen. Yeah. There are emerging markets for hydrogen on an industrial scale, more so than we have now, in Europe, uh, Japan. Energy is completing a a power plant in Texas that will be powered by hydrogen. So we're going to have a fuel revolution as we move to hydrogen. We can be making that here, and that would be, again, blue hydrogen, net carbon neutral, um, uh, we just have to think about it and plan for it and execute. That will be jobs continuing to use our methane, employing our workers to produce that methane, but creating new jobs for those building the pipelines, the storage facilities, and the hydrogen manufacturing facilities. So you have a state like Louisiana that knows how to produce resources. Yep. We have ample storage facilities and, and, and sites. We have a tremendous pipeline infrastructure already in the ground. We have the know-how, the industrial contractors know how to build it and expand it right there. And our regulatory opportunities, it seems like, are ahead of other states. So we're primed for that. And we got the workforce. And we got the workforce. So all all that's there. Um, Obviously, right now, in the current day, you know, it's it's awesome to have, as Wayne Gretzky once said, you know, you skate to where the puck's going, not where it's at, right? So we love we're skating in the right direction there. At the same time, we've got an energy workforce right now that's concerned with the, the leasing ban, other things. Give us an update on what you're hearing for the administration. Not, It's exciting for what the future may lie, but what, what's going on today is how they're looking at the Gulf of Mexico and the leasing ban. Any update on that? Yeah, so um, they, 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 they will not admit that, and maybe, they ha- maybe they're not going to, that they're going to stop leasing. Mm-hmm. Okay, We ask them directly, and all the representatives say we've not made a decision on that. So... Um, and, and the thing we have going for us is that the emission profile per unit of production in the Outer Continental Shelf in the Gulf of Mexico is the best or almost the best in the world. I think it's the best. Right. Better than West Texas, for example, of fracking. And so, Where the leasing ban is sending everyone to right now instead of right now in the clean Gulf of Mexico. In the clean Gulf of Mexico. So now I can tell you just because it makes sense doesn't mean they're going to do it, right? <laughs> 
But, well said. <laughs> but the more we pound on that, I'm hoping the more they will continue to support uh, and continue to lease um, in the Gulf of Mexico. I just read a recent report that somebody was projecting that when lease sales resume, that there won't be as many blocks of land bid upon, but there'll be more bidders for particular blocks of land. Okay. So big industry, big, the super majors will become more focused on where they think they can get ample production. Now, to that end, let me also mention this. There's clearly going to be a lot of offshore wind production as well. Mm -hmm. There are people in South Louisiana building boats for those projects. I'm told that Schwest has a $250 million contract uh, for a Jones Act compliant boat for an offshore wind farm in the Northeast. So we also have to position our industry to support offshore wind. Lastly, I'll mention that uh, we also know there's a virtuous cycle. We get more revenue from offshore, wind produ uh, offshore energy production. We in Louisiana use that for coastal restoration, which in of itself creates lots of jobs, lots of opportunity. Uh, we're working with uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, a senator from Rhode Island, to dedicate dollars from offshore wind production and maybe a separate pot from some current energy production to go to a coastal resiliency. Now, this would be nationwide, not just uh, Louisiana and Rhode Island. But it begins to set up the paradigm that as we have rising sea levels, we need to build in resiliency and trying to create that virtuous cycle nationwide of offshore energy production, creating funds for coastal resiliency, which in turn continues to support offshore energy production. Well, look, and if there's one thing we all know, you and I can both probably agree on this, no matter what that energy source is going to be down the road, whether it's traditional oil and gas, whether it's renewable, wind, or others, Louisiana's probably going to be a big part of the equation. Because what we've seen over the years is, you know, this isn't the first time we've talked about wind turbines off of waters, but in the Northeast, they said no for years, for decades. We don't want that off there. Florida has said that. West Coast has said that. They're going to come back to that Gulf of Mexico at some point. We're always here to provide fuel whether renewable or traditional, to the country to make it work. And I think our guys are ready to do that whenever, however. Um, and so that's exciting for, for opportunity for us. Um, in our closing minutes, let's do this. Obviously, you're a physician by nature. I'm sure there's some things you're working on in the healthcare space. You've always been a leader on that in Congress. Give us uh, an update if there's anything that you're, that you're working on right now that folks back home maybe haven't heard about, but is taking your time up in D.C. that you want to try to help uh, make a difference on. Uh, so uh, oh, we got four. We got uh, the, the big issues we're working on. Um, let me let me just speak to this. Everybody's concerned about the high cost of medications. Uh, you speak to um, anybody who's a successful business person, and they will complain about healthcare costs being their number one cost. I think Art Farr of uh, Performance Contracting said when he started, healthcare costs was a fraction. Now it's as big as expense. Mm -hmm. Hear it all the time. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember that, I remember many of the things about my conversation with ARP, but that was one of them. Uh, we are trying to lower the cost of health care. We had two bills signed into law two weeks ago uh, that are going to lower the cost of the most expensive and the least expensive drugs. We've already passed multiple pieces of legislation that would lower. Under the Trump administration, we actually saw drug prices come down. Uh, the Biden administration uh, wants to continue to make those efforts. They're doing it a little bit government heavy. heavy. Um, uh, so we'll see where we work out. But again, he just signed two of our bills into law. They say there's no silver, silver bullet to decrease the cost of prescription drugs, but there is prescription buckshot. There's, there's, there's silver buckshot. And so if we do lots of little things, um, then we can make that better. Secondly, surprise medical billing. Um, everybody's had an employee who went to an in-network hospital so I got, got, got treated by an out-of-network physician. They had no clue they were out-of-network, uh, but they were out-of-network, and they got a $10,000 bill. Um, that's wrong. If your business has negotiated for in-network pricing at a certain facility, you, are reasonably, uh, you should reasonably expect to get in-network pricing for it all. Uh, we worked for about two years on this bill. It was signed into law. Um, signed into law this past year, 
And so now if somebody goes to an in-network facility, they will get in-network rates no matter who treats them, number one. And number two, if they go someplace for an elective procedure, if somebody is out of network, they have to inform them of it and show them the price. Now, we're not going to get reform until we have price transparency. This is the beginning of price transparency, and it's the sort of thing that your members are going to relate to uh, because that's how they do their business. So we feel good about that. So as usual, you're sinking your teeth into a lot of uh, deep, heavy topics, and uh, that, that's been your brand from day one. You've always been one of those guys who tries to tackle tough issues in a very comprehensive way, and so we appreciate that about you. Um, look, I, I don't want to take too much of your time. I appreciate you coming in. We've covered energy. We've covered the pathway to the new uh, green economy. We've covered some of the things on health care. Anything we forgot to mention that you want to make sure you leave here? You know, uh, I do think we have to work on workforce development, continue yep. to work on workforce development. I'll just mention one more thing uh, uh, because I think it affects a lot of your members. Uh, I'm really interested in dyslexia. 20% of the population doesn't read the same way that other people read. And whenever I meet a really smart contractor who, like, didn't really do well in college. Like one guy told me he majored in Greek theater. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I sat in the Greek theater and I drank beer. <laughs> <laughs> and no comment whether my college experience resembles that or not. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I said, hey, man, you, you dyslexic? He goes, yeah, I am dyslexic. Uh, but he's really he's done very well. He's really smart. Uh, and he's quite successful. And so uh, for workforce development, until we get better reading scores, something you were always good at, Stephen, when you worked with uh, Governor Jindal, what can we do for, health, for education reform? Very interested in school choice, very interested in how we can begin to screen those 20 percent of kids with dyslexia so they're not left behind. 100 percent. And I would tell you, I know you and your wife have had a personal passion on this for a long time. have done tremendous work here in Louisiana on this issue. Um, I'll tell you right now, actually, one of our children is moving to uh, – Brighton School here in Baton Rouge oh. this year focused on dyslexia. And the big takeaway I have learned is that many of the techniques that work in those schools for kids that may have a challenge with reading or speech, those same tactics work for other children very well that don't have challenges with it. Some of the ways that you can educate using those models isn't just for kids with certain exceptionalities, but it works for children all uh, on, on all up and down the chain. And so um, there's a lot, there's almost an incubator of interesting ideas that come from, from schools like that who focus on those kids with exceptionalities. We so. should have science-based curriculums for our children, so whatever their need is should be informed by science, not by inertia. That's right. And we in Louisiana have got a population which needs to do better academically if our, if our state's going to do better and if they are going to achieve their potential. So, uh, so again, I applaud you for all the work you did on School Choice way back when. And if anybody wants more information on that, have them get in touch with me. Sounds good. And you heard it here first. If you want more information on that and more, you know where to find <laughs> Dr. Bill Cassidy in the U.S. Senate. So thank you so much for joining us here today. We appreciate your time and appreciate what you do for Louisiana. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Have a great day.